uh, answers, uh, giving my opinion uh, to a series of questions recently asked by a colleague of mine, Dr. Uh, Gavin Giovannoni uh, at Bart's Hospital in London. Uh, he recently posted on his blog a series of uh, very in intriguing real-world questions about how alentuzumab, codenatal Lemtrada, uh, works in the real world and questions about it. And so uh, I'm going to use Periscope to send out uh, my own personal opinions in response to his questions. This is the second installment. Uh, you can check back through my feed and find uh, the first questions. So the questions being asked now um, have to do with transition from one drug to another. In the first question, he writes, how exactly do you transition patients at high risk for PML from natalizumab to alemtuzumab? And so to use trade names, you're on Tysabri and you're at risk for PML. And we're going to switch you to Limtrata. And how do we do that? And so uh, I can tell you how I do it. Uh, the first thing I'll say is, is I personally do not feel that an, a lumbar puncture is required. Uh, I don't want my patient to have to go through an LP to look for JC virus. There are some practitioners that feel that this is an important step, and I respect that, um, although I don't feel that the risk benefit is adequate, uh, and it's not something that in our program that we routinely do. I do think that having an MRI brain uh, so that you can look for subtle signs of PML uh, radiographically is a requirement, really, as we transition. So I want to have a scan, a re relatively recent scan, prior to the switch so that I can look at that scan and feel confident and comfortable um, that I'm not putting the patient at risk uh, for something like a PML. And so I do think that an MRI with contrast is an important piece as we go from uh, Tysabri to Limtrada. Now, the timing is very, very important. Um, in the clinical trials, we waited six months after stopping Tysabri before starting Limtrada, and that's six months too long. When you think mechanistically about how these drugs work, um, I have a very strong opinion that I do not want to wait. Tysabri pushes all of the white blood cells into the bloodstream and it doesn't let them get into the blood brain barrier, so it doesn't let them get in the brain. So you put them all in the periphery. Alemtuzumab kills lymphocytes uh, almost, uh, basically 100% in the bloodstream. So if you give someone Tysabri for a while, and then let's say January 1st they get Tysabri, and then February 1st they get Lemtrada, no washout, you've really primed the pump. You've put all the cells in the periphery, and bam, then you can knock them out with Lemtrada. And so I, that's the way that we like to transition. Um, we, uh, we have had great success in doing so. Uh, I can share with you anecdotally that I haven't seen breakthrough disease and knock on wood, we haven't had problems with stacked immunosuppression. The, the, um, the second question along the same lines is, how exactly would you transition patients from fingolimod, gelinia, to alemtuzumab, limtrada? So you're gonna go from the pill gelinia to uh, limtrada. And would you be guided by peripheral counts? Now, in counterpoint to what I said about Tysabri, I do feel that a fingolimod or gelenia washout is necessary. When you take gelenia, within a couple months, you, um, you've created a situation where 80% of your lymphocytes are, in your, are trapped in the secondary lymphoid organs, in the, in the lymph nodes. And so when you stop gelenia, they come back out, but it can take months to come back out. Now, the reason this is relevant is when you give someone Lymtrada, there's a 100% kill in the bloodstream, but only a 70% kill in the lymph nodes. So if I had you on Gelinia and immediately gave you Lemtrada, 30% of the cells I can't touch, and that's 30% too many. And so I do feel that it's appropriate and necessary to prevent um, inadequately using the drug or inadequately dosing someone that you wait after Gelinia until the white counts tell you it's okay. And what do I mean by that? We like to follow peripheral white counts with a differential. I look specifically at the absolute lymphocyte count, <clears throat> the absolute lymphocyte count, excuse me, and I wanna make sure that that's coming back into the normal range. We'll check it about every two weeks to every month, and oftentimes it can take two months or so. Now, there have been case reports of people going out to nine months before their cells normalize, but most often it happens about two to three months. When I take someone off a of DMT, it makes me concerned, and so if they've had active disease, I may give them a slug of steroids, like a, uh, a gram of IV solumedrol, once monthly, leading up to the time that we do uh, the alemtuzumab. And so that's how I make that transition. I do think that a washout driven by white count you know, monitoring the white count uh, is appropriate with gelinia, probably necessary. The third piece to this question is what, uh, what principles do you apply to other drugs associated with lymphopenia? Now, lymphopenia is a doctor word for low white counts, and specifically the lymphocytes, that portion of the white count. And that is a way of saying that you're immunosuppressed. And so the question is, if you have someone immunosuppressed on drug A, and now you're going to put them on Lemtrada, what things do you think you need to think about? And this is difficult, and I want to specifically use the example of dimethyl fumarate, uh, codename Tecfidera. 
So dimethyl fumarate does not work by suppressing the immune response, or at least we don't think so. But there's a side effect where 21% of patients will have some drop in the lymphocyte count and about 6% really drop low. And so it's a tricky thing. Arguably, you could wait until the cells all normalize by giving it time and then make a transition to alemtuzumab safely. And that's something that you might do. Um, again, I would probably give some steroids in between if, uh, if, if there wasn't a sense of urgency. Now, the problem is oftentimes we're using lemtratum when we feel we really need to. And so there have been times, I'll share anecdotally, where we have opted not to do that. And that was a risk-benefit decision. We risked stacked immunosuppression, which is nothing to sneeze at. But the benefit was to get the patient's MS shut down. And I think that needs to be decided on an individual basis, keeping in mind the two factors, the risks of stacked immunosuppression in counterpoint or in balance with the risk of, of having a period of time without treating your MS. And so that's how we do it. This is my second installment of answers to Dr. Giovannoni's questions. Again, my name is Aaron Boster with Ohio Health. Thanks for tuning in, and uh, we'll jump back on and answer some more questions soon. Thank you.